Welcome, my name is Jeff Bartles. Uh, today's session is called Autodesk AEC Collection, the best tool for the job. We like to say the best tool for the job because uh, some of our customers have, have grown up on our uh, hero products, uh, Revit, Civil 3D, some of the applications like that. And, and many times when you're working on a project, you know, the, you got that one hero product that you're familiar with and you tend to use that for just about everything because that's, you know, you spent the time of the learning curve getting used to that tool, so you try and you, you try and leverage it as much as you can. What we're going to do today is look at some of the other tools that are available in the collection, what you have available to you, because there are tools in there that are dedicated to some of those workflows that uh, if, you, if you use those tools, it can actually help you uh, boost efficiency. So that's, that's our goal is just to introduce some of the other tools that you have access to. Just a little bit about myself. I've been working in the civil infrastructure industry for more than 20 years. I was the CAD manager at a civil engineering and consulting firm in Illinois, which is where I'm, where I'm from. I, uh, for a good portion of that time, I, I did standards. I installed software. I, I worked on plan sets, site plans, things like that. Uh, I also was responsible for doing implementation and training in the office. The, uh, I've been training Autodesk applications for almost as long for a good portion of that time, I worked for an Autodesk reseller where we did a ton of civil 3D implementations throughout the um, Midwest United States. I've been with Autodesk now for six years, been fortunate given presentations, and on occasion I still get to do a little bit of training. I, I am a, a contributor to a blog called Civil Immersion. I've got the URL there on screen. That's a blog that myself and a couple other technical specialists put together. And the purpose of the blog is just to provide how-to content. You, you go there and there are hundreds of short recordings, six to eight minutes, that show you how you can accomplish workflows using several of the tools in the collection. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, there's some really good content there. Since we're gonna be talking about the collection, I thought we would uh, start by defining it. The collection is a, a grouping of just about every application that you might need to accomplish an AEC project. Everything from conceptual design all the way through uh, finished high-end visualizations. On screen, we can see the list of applications that are available there. There's more than 29, I believe. Today, we are going to touch on, the goal is to try and hit on this many, the ones that are highlighted there. We'll look at uh, how we can leverage those uh, in an, for an AEC project, infrastructure project. So the project that we'll be looking at today is going to be a small commercial site plan. I use a small site plan because that fits well into the time frame that we have. Uh, that being said, you can use these tools for projects of any size. And we're going to be looking at workflows that fit into several of the, the stages that we typically go through with a civil infrastructure project, everything from conceptual design all the way through up through uh, value add. Uh, value add is, I like to call that the uh, visualization stage. If you have a, a project that where it uh, makes sense, we have tools that can create really nice high-end visualizations. We'll then uh, wrap up with a summary, and if there are any questions as we go, um, by all means, by your way, we can, we can answer those as they come up. We'll also take any questions here at the end. The goals for today's session is to give you some exposure to the AC collection. We are going to be reviewing just a subset of, of what it's capable of, because we could spend an entire day talking about each of these tools if we wanted to. We will also be discussing several of the business benefits. You can see some of those on screen. We'll talk about more as we get into this big thing, uh, it's going to be a PowerPoint free zone. I'm, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint rather than showing you bullet points and screenshots and things like that. I'd rather work live in the software. I find that's more compelling. And uh, I like to bring that up because anytime we work live, it can be both an exciting and a frightening time uh, because no two presentations are the same. So it'll be fascinating to see how this one goes. So let's talk about the, the commercial project. This is going to be a project that maybe, you know, you, you know, historically, maybe this would be something where you try and accomplish everything just using Civil 3D. On screen, we can see an aerial photo of the proposed project site. It is located just south of an existing car wash along a, uh, a main, main drive. Here we can see the zoning map for that property. Our project is located right here. It's zoned business. If we look to the south and to the west, we can see these areas are zoned residential and to the east is unincorporated. There happens to be a church there currently. So if you've ever worked on a commercial project that is adjacent to residential, you know that the residents coming to the public meetings aren't coming to tell you what a great idea 
your project is, they're coming because they've got questions. How is this going to affect them? Uh, so some of the things that we look at today in the collection are going to help us answer some of those questions. So what is the commercial venture that we'll be putting in? It's going to be a fast food restaurant called Chicken and Waffles. <coughs> now, Autodesk Legal thought it would be a good idea for us to mention that this is not a real project. In the event you have a second or third cousin that lives adjacent to the site, we are not actually putting a fast food restaurant there. So throughout uh, today, we're going to be looking at several workflows using the collection. I've got uh, 10 plus tools there. We're going to get through as many as, as time permits. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump into the de demonstration. I'm going to start out in InfraWorks. Uh, InfraWorks is an application we can use to very quickly create 3D existing conditions models. Uh, it does a lot of other things, but one thing it does really well is create existing conditions uh, in just a matter of minutes. If I, you know, for this project, let's say maybe I want to create some type of an exhibit, I can just show the city and say, conceptually, this is what we're looking at putting on this lot. And uh, we, you know, we don't want a full approval for it, but we just want to see if you see any red flags, you know, uh, with this concept. Historically, you might do something like that, maybe putting an aerial photo on a, a plot, maybe mark it up with a, with a marker. Um, but if you really want to tell the story about what you're doing, uh, 3D, nothing tells the story better than 3D. Uh, historically, 3D has been expensive, um, but now we can do it really quick here with InfoWorks. Let's look at that. In the InfoWorks application, we have several tiles. Each of these tiles represents a model that I can open. If I want to create a model from scratch, I can come up and just click the Model Builder button. Model Builder works a lot like Google Earth. I can type in an address. I can type in a uh, community. I'm going to type in uh, East Dundee, Illinois. That's where this uh, site is located. And this, so this is on the internet. I can take and pan around and find my uh, area. Currently, I'm viewing this using a map view. I can also go to an aerial view if I want to. So there's my site. If I wanted to build a, an existing conditions model from this, I would simply select a selection method, grab as much of the area as I want, and then I would come down and give this model a name. We'll call it sample. And then I would click create model. When I do that, InfoWorks is going to go out and find any freely available content online for the road center lines and for building footprints. Those are going to be coming from the OpenStreetMap data set. It will also find any aerial photography using the Bing data set, and it will grab USGS topography for me automatically, so we don't have to grab that stuff ourselves. This is just meant to be a starting point. You can use this to create a quick model, and then you can add to it if you want. The, uh, that's, I guess that's the thing I want to stress, is you can, you can incorporate your own data as well. Now, when I click Create, well, I'll just I'll click Create. It'll come up and say, uh, you know, this could take a couple minutes depending on the size of the area that you picked. I think our area was only 0.2 square kilometers. We can go up to 200 square kilometers. Eventually, that model will show up in the interface. Uh, I'm going to click to open one that I created a little bit earlier. You can get an idea of, of what that model might look like. I've got an aerial photo there. This does have relief. It's Illinois, so it's flat. But... We do have some relief here by the water area. You can see it found a water area and it applied the material to that. It found a couple building footprints. This happens to be a, a park district community center area, so that's probably why those showed up in that data set. Let me orbit this around. So really quick, I've got a, a nice you know, uh, blank canvas here representing my existing conditions that I can take and, and further augment. As, a, as an example, I would like to improve the quality of my existing ground surface. You can see that at the site, there's a overgrown stockpile here. There's also a detention basin. There's a, a bit of a kind of a ridge through here. Let's see what the uh, USGS contours look like that we got. In InfraWorks, I can draw what's called a parcel. I'm just going to pick some points here. I'll just work my way around the lot. And when I finish with my shape, I can come over, much like we can in Civil 3D, I can use these properties. I can say, let's just turn on the contours. I want those at a one-foot interval, and they're a little hard to see at this visual style. Let me change this to site view. So there's the contours that I got from USGS. So if you've ever worked with USGS surfaces before, you know it's not the most detailed 
stuff in the world. Um, not bad. I mean, if I if I hover over these and we look in the lower left corner, if you have really good prescription lenses, um, you can see in the lower left that's the 854 contour elevation 853 two one. As I uh, as I move around through here, so just from a rough uh, stormwater perspective, I know that the the water probably flows in this direction. All right, I would like to improve the quality of this existing ground surface. This is where I could leverage a drone. We have technology that allows us to build 3D models from imagery. I could take my uh, cell phone and I could walk around the conference room table taking pictures of the table. As long as I had 80% overlap or better on those images, I could upload those images to the cloud and produce a 3D model of the table. We could do that for tables or we could do it for an entire site. The, the, the trick to the site is holding the camera that's where the drone comes in. Let me drop out of this momentarily. We'll jump to the next slide here. The software that we're going to be looking at here is called uh, Pix4D. This is something that's not in the collection. This would be the uh, software that you would buy that would be compatible with your hardware. And this flies the drone for you. It uh, takes the pictures and ensures that you have the appropriate amount of overlap. There's several tools. Pix4D is what we're using in the example, but you could also use Drone Deploy or Site Scan, some of those other tools. Basically, the way this works, um, there's a tablet associated with your controller, and you can set up what's called a mission. You can take and draw out the area you want to collect over an aerial photo, and it creates that lawnmower pattern to collect the images. Most of these work the same way, just with grips. If I update that mission, it also updates the pattern. Likewise, I can pre-program the elevation of the drone, which will also update that pattern. All right, let me pause this. And let me show you this. Using that tool, we captured these images. As I step through these, you'll, you'll actually see that uh, lawnmower pattern. Okay, so the drone was flown totally autonomously to capture those. Let me go back to my slide here for a second. So once we have those images, we use a tool called Recap Photo which is in the collection. Uh, recap photo, very small learning curve to this. In fact, there's not a whole lot to the interface. Basically, we just have to tell it, you know, how do we collect the images, aerial or, or with a tripod? I said aerial, here's where I would grab those images and then I could load them into the interface. Now, if you have, um, if your camera is integrated into the drone, the it can capture the altitude and the latitude and longitude and apply that as metadata to each image. This application can use that then to scale the um, mesh that it's going to create and physically put it at that location on the globe. If you want this to be tied to survey data, it's got an option there called uh, ground control points, where if you know an XYZ coordinates of some locations on the site, we call those like salient features. If, uh, if you have uh, known coordinates, you can assign those to the, to the mesh and have this line up with your survey. Uh, so this is a cloud-based tool. In the upper corner there, you can see I'm kind of hovering to show. There's 65 photos, which equates to 12 cloud credits, about $12. And we can go up to 1,000 images. And I think the, that was like around $50. In addition to creating the mesh, I can also have it create a point cloud from the photos. I can also have it create an orthographic image. If you've ever worked on a project and you wanted contemporary aerial photography with the, uh, with the project, you could use this tool just for the purpose of creating those, uh, those ortho photos. Now, uh, here I'm opening up the image and recap photos, or the, uh, the mesh, so you can see what that looks like. So just from images, we have a, a fairly decent representation of that, of that site. We can see the stockpile of the detention basin. We can kind of see some of the, the, uh, the ridges there in the property. I always like to say that this isn't meant to be a replacement for survey. Uh, since we are building the surface from imagery, we have to remember that we're capturing the top of the vegetation. Um, now, if you had a LiDAR scanner on your drone, uh, you could actually create survey-grade surfaces from that because this that would shoot through the vegetation. But 
This can produce a much uh, more accurate surface than what we're getting from the USGS, and it'll be fantastic for conceptual design, even a little preliminary until we get the survey crew out there to do a topography. So uh, I said that we could create the mesh. We could also have it generate a point cloud. I'm going to jump out of this. And I'm going to jump into uh, Recap Pro. Recap Pro is in the collection. Recap Pro is our tool for managing point cloud data. Uh, we can use this to register point clouds together. We can visualize point clouds. We can crop them. Uh, more importantly, we can export point clouds from here into a format that is acceptable by the other tools in the collection. That's why we have Recap. That way, each tool doesn't have to have a point cloud engine in it. So here in Recap, I'm going to say New Project. Import Point Cloud. And I am going to select files to uh, import here. We'll go to my folder. And I will open the RCS uh, Point Cloud that was downloaded from Recap Photo. You can see just one. Uh, we could put a bunch of clouds in here and register them if we wanted to. I've just got one in this case. Let me choose Launch. And here we can see the, uh, the Point Cloud data that was generated from those images. Okay, not, not too bad. Not too bad since we were dealing with photos. Back in the day, I was lucky if, if um, you know, as somebody who used to have to draft the stuff, I was lucky if I got a couple snapshots from the survey crew of some things that were may, may have been a little bit complicated to draw. Uh, here, with the drone workflow, you can actually capture the site. If you had a question about something, you don't have to drive back out there. Uh, you can view it as a mesh or you can view it as a point cloud. You can reference the point cloud into Civil 3D if you want to. So I've got a, a ton of data here. I've got uh, thousands of points, each with a unique X, Y, Z. And uh, even though this is not survey accurate, I could still use this to gather intelligence from the uh, site. I've got a major highway here. I'd like to get the width of these lanes. And I, I don't want to be out there taping those while traffic is driving by. Uh, I can use the distance tool here and I can uh, take a measurement. Now by default, it thinks we're in Europe. It's giving me that in metric. Let me change this to feet. So I can see that lane is just over uh, 12 feet wide. I can use that same technique here to measure like the width of the sidewalk, width of the entrance. I can even use it to uh, capture elevations on this building. I'd like to find out how tall that building is. I can select the point data surrounding that building and kind of isolate that on screen. And then I can take a distance. <coughs> Maybe I'd like to lock the Z axis so I'm, I'm sure I'm getting a straight down measurement. We'll take this down to here. I can see that building is approximately 21 and a half feet wide. Now at the risk of destroying the end of the movie here, I'm going to be creating a, a preliminary engineering model that we could take to a, a public meeting and I'd like to incorporate some of these buildings that are you know, off my property. I can get a lot of my measurements right from here. I don't have to go on somebody's property and, and be taping their, uh, taping their building. So great tool just for uh, extracting measurements as well. So let me close this and we'll jump back over to InfraWorks. So I've got my point cloud. Let me flip my visual style here. Um, I can also use that point cloud to update my surface here in InfraWorks. And I could take and uh, reference this here under data sources. Here's where I could take in, uh, InfraWorks is an aggregator. It brings data together into one environment. I could come down and I could, I could take and uh, grab point cloud and bring that in. Might take a minute or two for that to uh, show up. Instead, I've actually brought it in here a little bit earlier. Let me turn it on. Right there, we can see the point cloud. So that, that matches up with my environment. In fact, you can see the point data kind of disappears here in the detention area. That's because it's actually going underneath the USGS surface that I had. If I wanted to build a surface from this point cloud, I can uh, come down here and choose point cloud terrain. And I can select the point cloud I'm interested in. There's several you know, optimization settings I can use. I'm just going to use the defaults here and choose start processing. And when I do that, InfraWorks is going to run an algorithm on those points and identify the points that it believes represent bare earth. And uh, it will then build a surface from that. 
It will also, um, you, through the optimization, you can, you can decimate the point cloud or simplify the data. You can say, I'd like to create a point cloud that is less dense than maybe all those points that we have, but I still want to keep the same shape. Um, and by doing this, you can build a surface that is one-tenth the size if you were going to try and build the surface just through Civil 3D. Uh, so I'm generating the surface here. In addition to building the surface, it has the ability to identify uh, and extract vertical components from the point cloud. Uh, it can, you know, as it's, as it's working its way across, it'll see a constellation of points that goes up. It can isolate those, and then it can look at those and say, I believe the shape of that is a tree. I believe the shape of that is a car. Um, I believe maybe this is a street sign or something like that. And uh, it has the capacity to actually put those objects at that location at the appropriate size. And then you can go through and, and make adjustments to those if necessary. Uh, it's even smart enough to learn. Uh, as it looks at things multiple times, it can, you know, mailboxes, things like that. You, it, it can learn and, and put the appropriate symbol there. One last thing as it's extracting, another thing we can extract from the point cloud is uh, 3D line strengths, like the break lines. It does that based on the intensity of the point cloud. So if you captured the, uh, the shoulder, edge of pavement, uh, lane striping, basically anything that it can see, you can go through and, and have it automatically trace that those entities. And um, uh, once we trace those, you know, they, in, in here, you know, you could display them, but you could also export those into Civil 3D. Just another way if you wanted to generate a road surface or something like that, we can do it from the brake lines. So once this finishes processing, I will have that data in the model. It'll take and show up over here in the Model Explorer. It gave me an overlay. I don't need that. I'm going to turn off the point cloud here for a second. And let's go to surface layers. Right here, I've got a new surface that was generated from that point cloud. Uh, back in the day, back probably the last time I was here, InfraWorks didn't support multiple surfaces. It does now. So I've got this new surface. I can just drag this down and put that at the very top of the ground surface in InfraWorks, and I can say, let's turn it on. And I'll click OK. That point cloud surface will now take over in this area. And if I change this view here back to site, you can see that I've got a much more detailed surface model there than what I started with. OK, more, more accurate than the... Um, USGS, this, you know, if I'm going to take this conceptual design to the city, I want this to be as, as accurate as possible. So now that I have my surface taken care of, I would like to uh, start creating some conceptual designs for the parking. I could do a little bit of that drawing here in InfraWorks, but InfraWorks isn't meant to be a, a CAD tool. It's more of an aggregator. We have other tools in the collection for drawing. So let's do this. I'm going to minimize this and I'll pull up uh, Map 3D. I'm using Map 3D because I can leverage geospatial data. Everything I do here you can do in Civil 3D as well. Um, so here, here in uh, Map I can see that the drawing that I'm opening has a coordinate system assigned to it. So it's asking me if I want to use the online uh, map data. This will, this will display kind of an infinitely large aerial photo within the uh, CAD environment, which is kind of nice. You can see as I back up, that, that takes an updates. So there's my, there's my site. Since I'm going to be doing a conceptual design of the parking lot, I'd like to get an idea of where the property boundaries are. We're still at the conceptual stage yet. I don't want to be sending the survey crew out to do a survey. Uh, I do happen to have geospatial data for the parcels. So if I come out into my folder here, I have a shape file called uh, parcels. I can take that. And uh, one really nice thing in, in um, Autodesk applications, if a particular file format can, can exist within the environment, many times you don't have to know the, the tool to import it. You can just drag and drop it into the application. So just dragging and dropping that in was the equivalent of doing the FDO connection. I've, I've actually linked to that shape file. One more thing I should mention. Um, since I was here last, we can now take and connect right to ArcGIS Online or an ArcGIS portal uh, and, and do the same thing. So if you have access to that data, you, you don't have to make shape files. You can go right there and, and pull the layer in from there. So now that this is in the application, I can stylize these parcels much like I can in a native geospatial application. 
Uh, they're a little hard to see through, so let me change the colors here a little bit. I'm gonna, I'll change the boundary color to blue. We'll change the fill color to a lighter blue, and then we'll drag up the uh, transparency. I'll click Apply. We'll close this up. So there we go. This, this is the parcel that I'm interested in. Uh, one nice thing about bringing geospatial data into the CAD environment, we don't lose any of the attribution. Since I'm linked to the shape file, if I select this parcel boundary, I can come up from the contextual ribbon and click table. <clears throat> this will show me the table data. I can find out who owns the lot. I can find out what the address is, you know, parcel index number, all of that information that came along from the shape. In fact, any parcel that I click on here, it'll take me right to that area in the table. I can also go in reverse. I can select the table and it will show me the, uh, the parcel. So all of that CAD data is, or all of that geospatial data is available in the CAD uh, environment. I can also, I can take this parcel. There's an option here, check out. I can check that parcel out into the drawing and then I could edit its shape. I could change the data in the table and then I could go right back and say check in. I could take and push those changes right back. In this case, I could push them right back to the shape file. Now in, in this example, I checked that out just because I want that boundary. So now that I've checked it out, I'm gonna explode it and then I'll, I'll hide these other hide these other layers. So there's my, there's my geospatial boundary. Here's where I could uh, start drawing my parking lot. And rather than having you watch me use my mad AutoCAD skills through the miracle of time-lapse photography, I'm just going to turn on some layers. And you can see there's my, there's my parking lot design. <coughs> so I just, you know, drew this with the, the AutoCAD functionality, offset, trim, okay, all of those tools. Once I get my design in a state where I, I'd like to uh, move it over into InfraWorks, I can then export this data into a geospatial format. There's a command called map export. Using map export, I can export CAD geometry into a geospatial format. So I'm doing it here just for some line work, but you could also do it with your civil uh, designs. Anything that you want to move into GIS, we can do with map, map export. Uh, I'm going to export the project site. I'll overwrite the shape file that I made a little bit earlier. So map export, I'm exporting a polygon. I want to select that polygon. If it had data associated with it, I could export that as well. Under options here, I'm going to say treat closed polylines as polygons. That's how closed shapes are stored in shape files. Let's click OK. And that was exported. I could then go through and export the parking boundary. I could export the stripes. I could export the islands. Each of those could be exported as a shape. Let's jump out of this. We won't save changes. And I'll flip back over to InfraWorks. So now that I have my conceptual design done, I can take and drop that into my InfraWorks environment. And this parcel that I made a little earlier, I just kind of sketched that on screen. I don't need that anymore. Let me delete that. Let's, uh, let's, bring, in, let's bring in our shape file or the shape files that we made. Here in the data sources panel, I could come down and, and grab the shape. Before I do that, let me just mention, you can see these are all the different file formats that we can bring into InfraWorks, that we can aggregate together into this environment. Let me also mention that InfraWorks is capable of connecting to several different database sources. And now, since, since the last time I was here, there's an ArcGIS Online button here as well. So I can take and bring my GIS layers from ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Portal right in the Infra InfraWorks environment. So for my example here, I'm, I'm going from shape. So let me choose that. And then I will jump into that same folder. There's the uh, project site shape file from today's date there. Let me click open. You can see that shows up here in the uh, data sources list. Once we make the attachment, we can then configure it. We just have to tell InfraWorks what this represents. So I'll double click to do that. And then I'll open the type menu, and you can see these are all the different types of objects that uh, can be represented in InfraWorks. Basically, you choose a type so that you could then go through and um, apply the appropriate style. I'm saying that this, uh, this parcel boundary is going to be a coverage area. Just drape it on top of the surface. And then I can choose a material. 
And InfoWorks comes with uh, a lot of materials out of the box. You can also create your own. I'm going to use this grass material. And I'll choose Close and Refresh. And when I do that, it makes the attachment, and then it will apply a material to that, and it will um, kind of create the appearance of a freshly mowed lawn there. Kind of gives me a, a blank slate to work from. Now, I did that attachment using the, the pull-down here. Remember, I said that we can do that with um, drag and drop as well. So if I grab, like, the parking lot shape, I can drag that in. And I can say this is a coverage area. And I'll apply a material to this. We'll go in the roadway collection, and I'll grab dark asphalt. As I bring these over, you can see everything is organized nicely in this list. Let's do one more. I'm going to grab the, uh, the island. I'll drag and drop that in. We'll say this is a coverage area. And under material, we'll choose roadway. And I'll grab this uh, concrete. So as I make these attachments, they're organized nicely on the palette. Um, the other nice thing, notice there's a refresh button up here. So I only have to do this connection one time. If my design changes in that other file, I can just export new shapes, just overwrite the ones that I had. And then I can come into InfoWorks and click the refresh button and everything updates. So I only have to do this once and I can, I can very easily update it. Uh, for subsequent changes. So now that I have this in the in the model, remember I said that it, it drapes. If I kind of orbit this up, you can see how that's kind of laying on top of that surface. If I was to show this to the city, that, that would probably generate a question. Are, are you going to grade that that way? And of course we're not. But I don't want to spend the time, you know, working out the grading for the lot right now. What I can do is select the, uh, the parking shape. I can right click and choose shape terrain. And I can, I can kind of pad this off. I can set an elevation for this. And what it'll do is, is kind of flatten that out, and then it'll blend the surface into the existing. So this way, this way, if I was to show that to the city, that, that's not going to generate a, an issue. That's nice and flat. All the coverage areas, they, it, it works. Um, anything that's on top of one that I adjust will conform. And these, these operate, they function using draw order. Just like, uh, just like they do in, in Civil 3D. Let's do one more thing. I'm going to uh, add a building. We'll say that maybe the uh, franchise, owner, um, franchise owner gave us... Oh, franchise owner gave us a building that we should use for this project. <clears throat> Some uh, fast food chains use the same building footprint regardless of uh, location. There we go. So the building they gave me is uh, FBX, which is a, it's kind of a, FBX is kind of like a universal um, model format. FBX goes into all of our applications, uh, but we can take SketchUp files, we can take Revit files, we can take uh, OBJ files from uh, 3ds Max, uh, we can take 3D uh, DWG files if we want to. So let me just, I'll drag and drop. Drag and drop, we'll tell InfoWorks what this is. It's a building. If I go to the 3D model tab, I can see it. And this particular building didn't have a geospatial coordinate system assigned to it, so I can choose interactive, and I can just double click to put this wherever I want. Okay, so very, very quickly, I created an existing conditions model. Uh, I was able to lay out some conceptual um, parking area and, and place the building. This gives me something nice I can show the city just, you know, from a conceptual perspective, do you see anything that might raise red flags? So we'll say city looked at it and said, you know, it is zone business or commercial. Uh, you're not putting a you're not putting a jail there. You're not putting an adult bookstore. Uh, we don't see anything that would, would really raise a red flag. We're not going to give you a, an approval for it just yet, but uh, we don't see any reason why you can't continue on with preliminary engineering. So knowing that. Let me minimize my InfraWorks, and I'll jump into Civil 3D. So we'll say we're in the preliminary engineering phase. Uh, the tool that we're going to look at next, I always like to say, is the one of the greatest secrets, best-kept secrets that we have at Autodesk. The application's called Raster Design. Uh, using Raster Design, we can incorporate images into the CAD environment. 
we can assign coordinate systems to images so that we can predictably put them in other drawings. We can merge images together. We can clean them up, um, color correct them. We can uh, extract geometry from them, geometry and text. Wonderful, uh, wonderful tool. So let's look at that. I'm, I'm going to open a drawing here. This is called Boundary. This drawing has a coordinate system in it. And basically, it's those same parcel boundaries I had before. These are just uh, polylines in this case, just so I can see where they're located. So I am going to, uh, let's, you know, the, the, the geospatial boundaries that I had, they're nice, but they don't show me things like easements or setbacks. I don't see all the information that might be, you know, important to know when I'm laying out my design. Let's say that we approach the city and ask for a plat <laughs> for this site, and they sent us one. I'm going to go back into my directory here. And they sent us a TIFF. I'm just going to drag and drop that in. We'll kind of pull that out. So here's the uh, here's the property, and I can see looking at the plat, looks like they've designated a uh, location where they expect a an access. Looks like they've got it as right in only. So I know right now I'm probably going to have to negotiate my parking lot with the city. I can also see that there happens to be a utility easement running through this, uh, as well as a setback here and a utility easement on the east side of the property. So let's let's use raster design to align this <coughs> to my geometry. When we load raster, it uh, comes up as a single tab in the ribbon. Raster runs on top of all the AutoCAD applications. I'm using it in Civil 3D, but you could use it in Map, regular AutoCAD, AutoCAD Architecture, AutoCAD MEP, all the other stuff that come in the collection. I'm going to choose Match, which will load the tool. And then as soon as this comes up, I'll pick a couple points. I'll, I'll pick a point here, and I'll align that to this end point in the southwest. And then I will pick another point up here, and I'll align that to the end point here. And then I will select this image. I'll right click and we'll say, so let's send that to the back. So the uh, the plat doesn't match perfectly with the geospatial boundaries. I don't expect it to, but this is, this is pretty close. It'll give me an idea. I have also uh, externally referenced that conceptual design. Let's reload that. So there's my parking lot. I can see, uh, fortunately, one of my entrances falls where they're expecting one. I can see that uh, this utility easement doesn't run underneath my building. That's, that's another good thing. And I can see that I'm not encroaching on the, uh, on the setbacks here in the back. So uh, not too bad. I can see that we were, uh, you know, it's not, it's not optimal, but it's not um, something that we can't recover from. Uh, so using raster design, I was able to align that. Uh, sometimes when people see that, they say, well, there's an align command in AutoCAD. We could do that as well. Let's, let's look at some of the other things Raster can do. For instance, if I come down to this legal description, you can see the city didn't send us the cleanest scan in the world. I can use Raster Design to clean this up. I'm going to start by going to Process Image, and I'll say Change Color Depth. I'm sure you'll agree this was a plat or a, um, a print at one time. It was all black or all white. So I'm going to change the color depth here to bitonal, which gives me the exact opposite of what I would expect. Let me go to cleanup here and I'll choose invert. There we go. So now it's all black or all white. It helps uh, accentuate some of the dirt that's on the scan. There is a tool that I can use under cleanup called despeckle. I can use this to clean the image. Basically, I will select the area of the image that I want to clean up. I could select it all if I want to. And then I would zoom in and pick a representative speckle, and it will grab every speckle that size or smaller. And when I press Enter, it'll, it'll take that out. Okay, still got a couple of the big ones. I don't want to go too big or I start losing periods, commas, things like that. Um, but we can clean the images from here. You don't have to use Photoshop. or In fact, I think that would be difficult in Photoshop, being a Photoshop user. Occasionally, we would on a, some of the stuff that I've worked on in the past, we'd get details that would come in through the fax machine. And then they'd want us to incorporate those into our plans, and they just look terrible. You almost wanted to redraw it as opposed to using that. Uh, but we could clean them uh, quite well using the raster tool. Now, uh, another thing we could do, I could extract this text 
maybe I need the text from this legal description in a exhibit. And um, goodness knows if you've ever typed a legal description, that could be one of the most painful things in the world to do. So I'm going to use the optical character recognition functionality. I can just click OCR and then I can pick two points that represent the angle at which that text was created. And I can come down and select the area that represents the legal description. And here in the verify text pane, I will see the original image on top. And down below, I'll see the extracted text. Any place where it ran into a word that it didn't recognize, it'll be green. And if I click on that word, it'll show me a little picture of the image. And I can see the T was kind of kind of blown out there. Let's fix that. I can take and drag this down a little bit further. State route, kind of put an apostrophe there. I'll put the space back in. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, it, it ran into the word monumentation. Now that's not a spelling error. It's just a word it didn't recognize. Uh, if I want, I can come over and click add to dictionary. So it'll never run across that again. So when I'm, when I'm finished, I can click OK. And if I click on this, this is now a paragraph of uh, mText. So I could drop this into an exhibit. I could even cut it to my clipboard and paste it into another application if I wanted to. All right, so raster design. Let me jump out of this. Uh, and you can see when I, when I go to get out, it says, hey, do you want to save the changes to the image? Uh, so I can, any change I made, I can actually save back to the photo from here, which is nice. In this case, I'm going to say skip all. Let's look at another tool. Another tool we have in the collection is called vehicle tracking. Using vehicle tracking, I can very quickly lay out parking lot geometry. If you've ever had to put parking stalls in, that can be a, a very time consuming process. I used to do a lot of parking um, additions for like a hospital or a school, and uh, you could be there for the day offsetting things and trying to create all the geometry of those stalls. Just to find out how many stalls would fit, uh, you, it takes you just as long to do it conceptually as it does to create them accurately. Vehicle tracking allows us to create stalls. It also uh, provides swept analysis tools. So if, you know, uh, any vehicles that have to access the site, delivery vehicles, refuse vehicles, emergency vehicles, we can ensure that they can get in and get out. So we'll look at some of that. Vehicle tracking, when it's installed, is a single tab in the ribbon. It loads on top of all the AutoCAD applications. So I'm using it in Civil 3D, but we could run it in Map. We could run it in regular AutoCAD if we wanted to. Um, we'll do striping first. The way striping works is you define a standard. You know, in, in the work that I did, our parking stalls were always 9 feet wide, 18 feet deep, 24 foot wide drive aisle, 21 foot wide if it was one direction. You might have different measurements for handicap stalls and the, um, and the, the safety zone and stuff. Basically, you'd punch all of that in and save it as a standard. And by default, it, it comes with a bunch of standards out of the box. I like to consider these starting points. Um, under US parking standards, there's a couple in here. If I right click on this, I can choose view. And you can see here's where we would take and punch in the measurements for <coughs> islands and bend islands and bay dimensions and service types and vehicle classes, uh, valid bay angles, all the different angles that uh, the stalls could be. You can even dial this up to uh, wheel stops and safety posts. I've logged a lot of time putting wheel stops in parking spaces that um, I really don't have to do anymore. So let me hit cancel. We'll close this. So once you've defined your standard, you can set that as the default, and then we can create parking stalls as fast as we can draw a polyline. So I'll start at the end point here, and I'll come down to the end point here. And if I was to continue on, you'll see how that would clean up. In this case, that's as far as I want to go, so I'll just press Enter. And then I have to tell it, do I want the stalls to the inside, both sides, or outside? I'll click to the inside to put them there. And then I'll tap my spacebar to go back into the command, and we'll put a couple more in here. Go from the end point here to the end point there. I'll press Enter, and then I'll click to the inside. So unlike the uh, traditional way of creating these stalls where they're all individual items, if I click this row, you can see it's, it's all one object with a bunch of grips that we can use to make edits. My favorite grip is this one. It allows you to pull it into a curve. If you've ever placed stalls along an arc, uh, that can be 
time consuming because the narrowest part of the stall needs to be your minimum measurement. Now I dragged that out, who knows what that radius is, but if I type DI for distance and I measure the narrowest distance of this stall, we'll see that's exactly nine feet. Okay. So let me undo, we'll put that back. I've got another grip here that controls the, uh, like the, the drive aisle. If I select that, you can kind of see some dots up here. That's my construction line that I use to show what the drive aisle width would be. This is uh, bi-directional. I can see it's going to encroach on my drive through lane. If I click this grip and pull this so that it's one way, you can see how that construction line comes in. So I can see, okay, if I made this one way, uh, that will fit with my drive aisle. Let me come over here since it's one way. I can use this grip to snap to the valid bay angles. That would be extremely painful to do if these were individual pieces. And then, uh, you know what? I really don't need the island here at the beginning. I can come up and hit my edit button, and I can say let's turn off the uh, let's turn off the start island. So, at any point, I can come up and click and create a parking report, find out how many stalls I have. I, I don't even want to admit what we used to do back in the day to count stalls. Um, it usually involved multiple people and averaging what everybody came up with because um, no two people came up with the same number. Now you can just get a, a parking count right from, right from the list there. <clears throat> Having said that, not all stalls are going to be the same. Some of these are going to have to be handicapped accessible. Instead of editing the whole row, I can click a button and I can edit just an individual stall. You can see a little red light comes on there. I'll click this stall, for instance, and here's where I can choose a different bay type, different measurements. This bay type's got a safety zone. Um, I can click copy two, so you can see it put one in there. I can go through and add two more if I want to. When I'm done, I'll hit close, I'll hit escape, and I can come right back up and generate another report. I've got 19 stalls, uh, traditional stalls, three accessible. There's my total, there's my percentages. I could export this into a CSV file and make a table out of it if I wanted to. I could even have it count the stalls and put the numbers on them. If, uh, if that was necessary. So a really, really quick way to generate parking lot uh, geometry. We can also use this for swept path analysis. Let's say that I had a WB40 semi uh, with a trailer that needed to pull in to do deliveries. I'm gonna make the assumption that they're going to be driving north and they'll pull in this side, drive around the building and park in the drive through lane so that they can unload here at the storage area. Here in vehicle tracking, I'll pick the auto drive arc tool, which brings up the library of, of vehicles uh, that I can choose from. There are hundreds of real, real, real world vehicles in here, uh, organized by country. Let me come down here to uh, US design vehicles. You can see these are further organized by state. Some of these were created for uh, DOTs. I also have the uh, statewide Ashto. And then this is available in different, you know, different years, metric, customary. We'll go into 2011. So here we can go through and s select our desired vehicle. There's also a wizard here. You can uh, you can create your own. I can mix and match what's there. I can take the cab from one vehicle and attach it to the trailer of another. Um, I can also create my own vehicles completely from scratch. I, I also like to mention that in this example, we're using kind of an outdoor situation where I'm driving a truck outside. This works indoor as well. Um, I can create those little golf carts they drive around the airport. Um, we can generate uh, like an MRI unit that moves around a hospital. Um, if it has wheels and you can steer it, you can model it with uh, vehicle tracking. I'm going to choose the WB40 trailer. We can see that's articulated. Let's choose proceed. And I will drop this down here in the roadway and I'll choose proceed. We drive the vehicle uh, just by picking on screen. I was, I was telling John a little bit earlier, uh, Back in my day, we used to have these uh, vehicles printed on acetate at different scales. We'd lay them down on the paper and try and, you know, see if the vehicle would drive in. Don't have to. Some people are still doing that. Um, so, but uh, you don't have to do that anymore. You can, you can actually drive the vehicle around. Um, so, and this, this, will, <coughs> this will print the acetate sheets if you like that. You know, we can, this will print the acetate sheets. I thought that was fascinating that you could still do that. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to pick a couple points to drive this in. Oh, one thing I didn't mention. As I, as I move this, you can see how the, the, even the wheels turn and the, uh, the arrow, the percentage changes. That is the amount of um, steering wheel. That's the percentage they're turning the wheel. Okay. 
everything from 100% left to 100% right. The steering of the vehicle is based on real world physics. There is a, uh, there's a, a five mile an hour speed put on that. You could change that if you want. Um, and then there's a certain amount of time. How long does it take the driver to go from a full left to a full right steering wheel lock? And so the faster the vehicle goes, the larger the, the, the arcs are gonna be. Uh, so you can customize all of that if you want to. But it's, it's based on real world, real world physics. Um, once I've drawn my path, it creates envelopes. The green envelope represents the path of the body. The red envelope represents the path of the chassis. And uh, notice that just like the parking, this is considered one object. Um, I can see based on my envelopes, I kind of uh, mounted the curb there. I can uh, click these pass-through points and I can edit this path, okay? I can, I can take and move this around if I want to. So let's just pull that down. You can see how that updates. Now I'm gonna try and pull it too far here. Yeah, if I pull it too far, it'll break the path and say, you can't physically get from this pass point to this one in the real world. So you don't have to worry about editing that to a point where it can't physically be, uh, the maneuver can't be done. Let me pull this back up. Now, uh, pulling that in, I was just driving using curves. There's another way that you can drive. This is the way I prefer. Notice I can also back some of these points out if I want to. I can use the geometry in the file to drive the vehicle. So as I get up to the entrance here, I can say pick alignment. I would like to pull in parallel to the back of curve here on the north. And then I'll choose pick alignment, and I would like to pull around the uh, east side of the building parallel to this curb. And then I would like to pull around the south side of the building parallel to this curb. I'm making sure that I don't uh, mount the island there. And then once I get far enough here, I don't need to turn on the bearing. I can take and back this up. Now, I can't back up a trailer in the real world to save my life. Just ask my dad. But I can, uh, I can back up a trailer here with vehicle tracking real easy. So I can, I can see now that that truck can get in there from a horizontal perspective. Um, now that we have the path, I can turn on things like uh, visibility sight lines. You know, what can, the, what can the driver see or, you know, how much can they see while they're making the maneuver? I can take a place, I can create an exhibit with the sight lines if I want to. Since I have a 3D parking lot, um, I, can project, I can project this vehicle up to that parking lot. Uh, this, this is the top surface of this was created in Civil 3D. So I just, I projected that up vertically and now I can, I can run an animation of this. Let's click drive or play. There he's driving. I've got a camera control. I can put myself in front of or behind the vehicle, left or right. Stay on the left side here. I can also put myself below or above. Let's get down a little bit lower here. Notice when he pulls in, you can see how it's actually driving up on that civil 3D surface. Uh, this will do a ground clearance check too. If you're, you know, if you've got a really long vehicle, um, some of the vehicles in Wisconsin that, tra that uh, transport the, the blades for the, for the uh, windmills, take and uh, they're quite long and when they make really wide curves and you wanna make sure they're low, they're, they're not gonna shear the uh, crown off the road. Uh, so this, you can do a comparison, the, the bottom of the vehicle to the uh, ground. So let me get above this for a second and we'll kind of drag him around here. In addition to seeing this from an overhead camera, I can also view things from the driver's eye. I can also say that when he backs up, like he's gonna do here in a second, I wanna see the view from his rear view mirror. So I can go through and, and I can establish, he can make the maneuver horizontally. Uh, he can make it vertically uh, from a clearance perspective. And I can also say that he, he'll be able to see while he's making the maneuver. And that, that uh, recording or that, that little animation that we did there can be uh, exported as a video that can be put into a, a PowerPoint or, or an exhibit. So that's vehicle tracking. Jump onto this. We'll go back to InfraWorks. Here in InfraWorks, um, you know, so as I'm generating stuff in Civil 3D, like that proposed surface, I could bring that over to update this model. I could uh, bring over the, the geometry, the parking striping, all the different things that I uh, that I was creating there. In fact, we'll see a more finished example here in a second. But uh, so as I make that content, I can be constantly bringing this over to InfraWorks 
to uh, to further augment my model here because uh, I want to create something I can take to a public meeting to, to get support for the project. Let's look at how we can add content. In InfraWorks, there's a uh, there's a, a draw tool. You can see these are all the things that we can we can draw. I can draw trees. I can draw utilities. I can draw roadways if I want. I can I can draw buildings. Let's say I want to add a tree. I'll just click tree, and uh, InfraWorks comes with a ton of content out of the box. Likewise, you can also download content from the internet. The 3D Warehouse is a phenomenal place to get uh, tools or you know uh, 3D models that you can then apply to to uh, palettes like that one. So I just double clicked to place a tree. If I zoom in on that tree. If I get close enough, you can see that the every vein and every leaf is visible. It's it's in a rendered state all the time. InfraWorks is a lot like a gaming engine uh, or a gaming environment, so you don't have to render this. That that is what it is. Um, very intuitive grips. I can use this grip to change the height. Use this grip to rotate. I can use this grip to move the tree around. That's one tree. Maybe I'd like to create a row of trees. There's a row of trees option. Maybe we'll do the yellow ones. Rather than double clicking to place, I will just single click. And now it lets me generate kind of like a uh, polyline. I'll just double click when I'm done. And the difference between a single object and multiple objects is you get this density slider. Farther you drag that to the right, more trees you'll have. And you can drag that left or right. At, I, could, I could go back and I could drag it back to the left and, and do fewer trees. Uh, notice that it kind of randomizes them, just so that they all don't look the same. If you click one tree, we can use the grips to edit that one tree. Click that tree a second time, and now we're editing the entire group. Now that you've seen that, you really know how to insert everything into InfraWorks, because everything, uh, all these little components, go in the exact same way. If I wanted to put a car in the parking lot, I'm going to go to City Furniture. That's like the catch-all. Uh, mailboxes, street signs, light posts, people, vehicles. I'm going to type uh, vehicle or start typing vehicle, and I'll grab the uh, the Audi. I'll double click, place that in the model. You can see the same grips. You can rotate that to kind of face the uh, the edge there, and um, maybe I want to put in a couple people. I'll go to city furniture and I'll start typing people. Maybe I will. Uh, I'll do this guy here. I'll double click. Okay. Locked his keys in his car, maybe. Okay, standing there just thinking about something. Very easy to uh, to take and flesh out a model uh, just by adding the content that comes in the application, or you can you can take and create your own, or or grab content from online. If you remember, this particular project is a chicken and waffle, so it's going to have very specific signage, much like a McDonald's or something like that. It's not going to have you're not going to find all of that stuff in the uh, Thing. If we wanted to create some of our own content, let's do this. I'm going to drop out of this. AutoCAD is a great tool for this. Uh, many times AutoCAD is looked at as an application for doing 2D drafting. It does a great job in 3D. So if you wanted to create some, some 3D content, this would be a vehicle that you could use. Now I'm, I'm in AutoCAD. We could do this in Civil 3D too. I'm just using the AutoCAD functionality. While this is coming up here, let me show you where I'm going. Let's say I want to create a, uh, a menu board for the drive through lane, something that's going to hold this picture. So as people drive around, they can say what they want to order, what they want to order. In AutoCAD here, let's, let's close this. So this is AutoCAD. The ribbon may look a little different. I just came down to the workspaces here and loaded the 3D modeling workspace. And I created a couple polylines. This is going to be the geometry that will make up my, my menu board. Let's go back to home here for a second. I'm going to choose move, and I'll move this rectangle. We'll just move this up a uh, foot and a half. Really nice tool in AutoCAD called Loft. If I select a couple shapes and hit Enter twice, it will create a 3D solid between them. Another tool, Extrude. I can click this closed shape and I can pull this up. 
maybe uh, five and a half feet. So there's the base of my sign. There's the uh, the top of my sign. I'm going to change the visual style here to X-ray so I can see through those. And then I can say move. Let's grab this top. I want to pick it up from the midpoint between two points. I'll pick it up from the midpoint between these two centers. And I'll place it to the midpoint between two points. And I'll grab these two corners. We'll flip this back to conceptual. So rather than, uh, rather than mapping my image to the front face here, I'd like to create kind of a picture frame effect. So let me just draw a quick line from point of curvature to point of tangency on the top and bottom. And then I will move these a little bit. We'll see where I'm going here in a second. We'll move that one down. We'll move this one up maybe a quarter foot. And then we've got a tool called press pull. I can click that shape and I can pull it out or, or, or push it in. I'm going to push it in 0 0.05. That gives me a nice little, nice little frame where I can map that image. So there's my geometry for my sign. Let's go to uh, realistic because now I'm going to assign materials to this. AutoCAD comes with a bunch of photorealistic materials out of the box. If I bring up the materials browser, we can see here's the library down below. This is the materials that are in my current drawing. Nothing, global. Uh, maybe I want to paint this yellow. In the search box, I'm going to type yellow. Works very similar to how it is in InfoWorks. If I type yellow, it'll show me every material that contains that uh, string, text string. And they're organized by type here. I'll just choose plastic. Let's drag the yellow material into my drawing, and then I'll drag it onto my parts. Now, uh, I want to create a material to, to put that photo on. So I can come down, I can create my own material if I want to. I'll call this menu board. And then I could apply reflectivity, transparency, don't need to do all that right now. I just want to grab that uh, image that we looked at a second ago. And then one last thing, I'm going to edit this image. If you're going to map images, uh, specific sized images in AutoCAD, you just want to make sure that the image is the same size as the face that you're mapping it to. And that little picture frame, I could measure it and show you, but I'm hoping you'll take my word for it. It's 2.1 feet wide, and it's five feet, five feet tall. There we go. Once my material's done, I can drag it over and drop it on that face. And then lastly, because I never want to walk away and have that uh, be off a little bit, there's a material mapping tool here that I can click that face and say, put the lower left corner of the image in the lower left corner of the face. So there's my, um, there's my custom menu board. Let's do a save as, and I'm going to save this out on the desktop. We'll use that here in a second. Another tool we have in the collection is called Formit. Formit is used um, to create the, like the general massing of buildings. The architectural side uses that frequently. This is how they'll uh, maybe lay out a building before they bring it into Revit. Uh, we can use it here. I'm going to use it for a building. If, if you remember that car wash that was north of the um, that was north of my project, maybe I got some measurements from the point cloud. I could use Formit to very quickly generate the uh, the shape of that car wash. Very uh, simple interface. We'll say that's uh, maybe 140 feet long by 32 feet wide. As I as I run through these applications, if you're if you're someone who um, who's using Civil 3D, there's a learning curve. To Civil 3D. There's a lot of stuff in Civil 3D. These other tools, not even close. You can learn InfraWorks in a couple days. You can learn this in in a half hour. Uh, there's there's not a whole lot to this. Um, I'm not a very smart guy. Ask my wife. Okay. Um, so if, if getting in and out of these, it's not, it's not bad at all. Um, this uh, does modeling very much like a press pull. Uh, for example, I've got faces, I've got edges, and I've got points. If I click this face, I can, I can pull it up. If you remember, um, I think that was like 21 and a half feet, something like that. Let's click this face. I'll pull this up to maybe 16 feet. That'll work for right now. Oop, I pan this over, and I'm uh, I'm not gonna 
certainly not going to try and draw the whole building here. I'll show you a finished one in a second. Maybe I do a little overhang, hold my shift key and grab both of those faces. I could pull those up a little bit. I could then go to my pencil tool. If you remember, the car wash had like a pyramid type roof on it. I could grab that point and I could pull that point up. Okay, so very quickly I can start laying out the shape of that building. Let me show you what that building would look like if you spent some time on it. Okay, um, format also includes materials. Drag and drop them on, much like we do in the AutoCAD environment. So very quickly I can start generating some of those ancillary buildings around the outside of that property here in format. And then when I'm finished I can just say export and I can export this locally I can export that using uh, FBX or OBJ. Several of these file formats will, will be accepted in Inforks. Um, FBX is the one that I used in my example. I've already created one of those, so let's jump out of this. We'll jump back here. And I am going to, uh, let's bring in that menu board. I'm gonna say I wanna bring in an AutoCAD 3D object. I will go to my oh, desktop, there it is open. So it's taking that, uh, it, it, in this case I'm linking right to that DWG file. So if I went in and edited the DWG I could come back here and refresh and, and have it update the, the menu board in here. Once it finishes processing that I can then configure it, tell InfoWorks what it is, city furniture, there it is, interactive placing, I want to take and put it right there. There is no difference in function between that menu board and a, and a tree or a, or a car or something like that. Let's orbit this around and I'm going to go back into my folder. There's the FBX I created for the building. And we'll place that right here. Try that one more time, right there. Okay, so very quickly I could go through and start, you know, fleshing this out, making this look more real. Rather than having you watch me do that, I'm going to open up one that uh, I've spent a little time on. This uh, this model contains a bunch of, uh, I mean, you can see it's the same model we started out with here. I'm going to load a bookmark. InfoWorks has bookmarks or saved views. Okay, it takes me right to that view. Um, all of the little accoutrements here were generated in AutoCAD. You can see my, there's my parking lot, that same one we drove on in Civil 3D. Uh, these are all coverages for the grass and the parking lot, or the, uh, the sidewalks and stuff. Uh, I exported that building from Formit using uh, just generic material, or, you know, muted materials since it's not part of my project but now this gives me a nice environment that I could I mean I could take this to a public meeting I've got the entire project here now I don't I don't have to be locked into printed exhibits um, if I wanted to there are tools here where I can adjust time of day okay we could do a uh, shadow study there if we wanted to I could adjust the uh, the dates the, the, I could change the the sky color if I want to we can create snapshots. If I want to, I can extract images from this and I can control the resolution. So I can pull really high resolution images. I can create uh, fly-throughs. If you've ever done a fly-through animation, you know that can take hours or days because it's got to render every, um, every frame. Here in InfraWorks, if I bring up the storyboard, I can say, hey, let's, let's add a camera path animation. It just saved my location in space. I can then zoom in and I can say, let's uh, let's save a spot here. And then I can come over here, save another one here. I can pan my way down to the corner, save another one, orbit up and get another. Maybe we could pan over the top of the building this way. Okay, you get the idea. Just in this one, um, you know, keyframe or, or uh, segment, I've got six different locations that I've saved. 
all I have to do is set the appropriate speed that I want to fly through those points. By default, it's 55 miles an hour, which is a little fast. I'm going to set this to maybe 13 miles an hour. There are pre-made uh, camera movements and pans and rotations and uh, just a whole bunch of stuff we can do. Let me choose play. And when I choose play, it'll, it'll create an animation that is, is, is smooth as glass. I, the, the folks connecting through the internet may be seeing a little bit of choppiness, but uh, when you see the recording, you'll see that this is smooth. I can have titles fading in and out. I can have captions fading in and out as I go. But you could take and create compelling visualizations in just uh, a matter of a couple minutes once you have the, the, um, the model in InfoWorks. I, I was one of the guys uh, when, you know, when my group or when the firm that I worked for would go to a public meeting, I was the guy that had to print all the CAD exhibits and then spray mount them on foam board. Um, never want to do that again, okay? Um, this, this, this would be much more, much more compelling to have at a meeting. Let's do this. Plus the, uh, the foam board, you spray mount it, and then it's um, a humid day, and by the time you get to the meeting, it's all warped and it's got a bunch of ripples in it. All right, let's look at another thing here. It's one thing to create a still image. It's another thing to uh, create an animation. We can, with the tools in the collection, create what I like to call low-cost virtual reality. We can physically put a stakeholder in this model. Let me go to uh, the export command here. I want to export this as a bounding box. I'll grab the amount of my project that I want to represent my virtual reality experience. And um, I'm exporting this as an FBX. All right, that, that universal file format. Let me click export. And uh, there's quite a bit of stuff in this model. There's a whole bunch of uh, you know custom little parts. I've got uh, cars and people and, and um, coverages. But you'll see that to, to export this out, it just takes a couple, couple seconds. When that's done, I can close this. And I can open up Navisworks. Navisworks is in the AEC collection. Navisworks is a, it's another aggregator. The, this tool historically has been one that you use to aggregate CAD models together from disparate vendors to produce a single, you know, a BIM environment. Uh, does a great job with that. We can do um, 4D and 5D construction simulation. We can do clash detection. It, it also creates stereo panoramas, which is what we're going to use it for here. I'm going to say open, and then on my desktop, if I've been living right, I should see my export that I just made. Let me open this in Navisworks. I don't lose anything. All the materials go along for the ride. So I can just, and, and some people, they've asked, you know, I've got like a seven mile roadway. Can I export the whole seven miles? Well, you could. It would be a huge file, but the, the VR thing, you, unless you can see seven miles, don't, don't export seven miles. Because uh, the, the thing that I'm going to show you with the smartphone, you'll be able to take and stand in one spot and look around. So you'd be better with a huge project to, to just grab pieces where you're going to be standing. So there it is. Um, another thing you'll want to do, if I select this, I can, I can right click and say, uh, I want this to be feet. It comes over by default, it's centimeters. And you can create a visualization from that. But when you're looking at it, it'll be like it's table size. And um, you'll, you'll, you'll know it when you look at it. It won't feel right. Um, setting that to feet, then it'll feel right. I mentioned that so that it's on the recording in case you want to use this later. Uh, let's orbit. So to do a, like a low-cost virtual reality, you basically just put yourself in the model where you want to be standing. and click the little eyeball tool, and I can take a look around. Say, this looks perfect. I want to render it. Uh, along with the collection, you get the ability to do cloud-based rendering. I want to render the current view. I want to render this as a stereo panorama. And just want to show you that it's, it's a cloud-based service, or I'm sorry, a um, cloud credit service. Even if you do a just a minimal one, it's it's zero. Yeah, you can it's free. Um, so you can render this a few times till you get things the way you like, and then you can go up and, and dial this up to final, and you can dial that up to. 2046 pixels and hold on that should say 13 
Yeah, it should say 13 unless it's gotten cheaper since yesterday. Um, but uh, so that once once you do that, then you can share this with anyone. I can say email me when this is done, and I would choose start rendering. Now I've already created one of these, so let me go to the render gallery. You'll, you'll get an email and it'll give you a hyperlink that you can click to view it, which takes you to the render gallery. I can also get to the render gallery right here in Navisworks. And you can see some of the renderings that I've been working on. When you open a rendering, uh, you can take and drag around. It's kind of like a, you're in the, uh, at the inside of a sphere. So I can, I can look up, down, left, right. If I wanted to share this, I can open this the share thing and I can, I'll get a, a, a link that I can paste into an email. If I send that to somebody, they can tap it on their phone and view this as a stereo pair. Or if they scan, if they scan the QR code, they can view that as a stereo pair. So let me, let me do this. I'll bring up my PowerPoint for those off-sites. So this is an example of some uh, QR codes. If those were scanned, this is basically what it'll look like on your phone. And then you can put your phone into a, a Google Cardboard or like one of those uh, Hamido lenses. Those are, that's probably one of the easiest ways to go because you just snap it on there and you're, you're set. Uh, you'll see this in 3D and you can, um, I mean, it's not bad. If you've ever, if you've ever used a ViewMaster before, it's basically the same, same principle. So there's some examples of uh, the type of viewer that you could use for this. Uh, those QR codes, the sky's the limit. You could print that, put it on a brochure. You could put it in the newspaper, you know. Um, anything that you can have in InfoWorks, or you can see these tools in Navisworks. So we're, we're making it InfoWorks, bring it into Navis, but really anything that you do in Navisworks too uh, can be made into a 3D uh, environment. And we're coming up on the top of the hour here. Let me show you just a couple other things that you get with the collection. With the collection, you have access to AutoCAD Mobile. Um, and this is not like a, uh, this is not like just some viewer. This is AutoCAD. It's just a really light version of AutoCAD that runs in the cloud. It's a, it's a mobile app that runs on your smartphone or your tablet. I'm running it on a tablet here. Um, and I've got basically uh, one of the drawings that we looked at today. I'm, I'm opening that from the cloud. And I have to admit, when this tool came out, if you've used Civil 3D, you're probably familiar with object enablers, things like that. First thing I thought is when I try and view this on the cloud, I'm not going to see my contours. I'm not going to see the parking striping. And uh, when I opened it up, I was like, man, I, I can't, you know. Um, it's not going to give me all of the properties of that stuff. It's just a, a visual. But uh, in this environment, I can take measurements. I can add annotation. Here I'm taking a measurement of um, the, the one drive aisle in the parking lot that is supposed to be 24 feet. is right there on the west side of the building. Maybe um, you know, there we, we measured the drive aisles, uh, the, the uh, drive through lanes 12, and um, I've got some storm sewer in there now. Maybe we can't have a uh, storm sewer length more than 200 feet. So I can use this. I can open up that, that drawing that came right from Civil 3D with the vehicle tracking parking stalls, and, and I, can, I can take and click. And... All right, one more thing here. If you have a project that warrants it, the AC collection comes with 3ds Max, and uh, 3ds Max is that's this application they use in Hollywood for movies like Force Awakens and Endgame and stuff like that. So it's one of the few applications if people say, "Can I do this in 3ds Max?" Yeah, yeah, you probably can. There's there's not a lot you can't do with 3ds Max. This model that we see here is the same model that was in Navisworks. Exported this, and there's a there's a tool called Civil View in 3ds Max that allows you to take and create paths for vehicles and things like that if you're not a 3ds max guru we happen to have a couple people on staff that, that do 3ds max all the time so we said hey how about if we give you the model and it just creates some content for us so i'll go ahead and hit play 3ds max can create people that are kind of milling about or having conversations they swapped out some of the vehicles obviously there in fact as this is panning around if you look in the lower right corner this was recorded from using a, a vr headset so you can, through 3ds Max, you can take in, through the uh, 3ds Max Live, you can take and export your content such that it could be viewed using a Oculus device or the Vive. 
and uh, 3ds max supports all the different lighting effects and i think even had some dirt flying around lens flare so today we looked at a lot of stuff talked about a lot of applications that are available in the collection if you're someone who uses civil 3d that hero product to do a lot of things I'm hoping that uh, seeing some of the stuff today inspired you to maybe uh, explore some of these other tools. They don't have the same investment of time to learn as a Civil 3D does. Vehicle tracking, raster design, form it, uh, a lot of those applications can be learned in just a couple hours. InfoWorks, like I said, maybe a day or two to, to take and pick that up. And then that URL, if you, I mean, if you're interested in that Civil Immersion blog, we've got a bunch of recordings on there that just show you, you don't have to know an entire tool to get in and do something meaningful with it. With that, I'm, I'm hoping that you would agree that this is why we say that the AC collection is the best tool for the job. And if anybody has any questions or comments or anything like that, we'd be more than happy to take those.